holodeck character, a fictional man. Greetings, you pop culture junkies, and welcome to Raw Rant, where your opinion matters, whether we agree with them or not. We're going to be here hanging out with some of your favorite nerds today. I'm your host, Shane, and with me as always is my brother, Brian. Hey now. Hey, there he is. Also with us tonight is a man whose Star Trek brain is so big, he could give the Enterprise computer a run for her money. From the Burnett work, Robert Meyer Burnett. Great to be here. Great to be here. Just in time, baby. The Talmud of Trek is here. <laughs> also with us, directly from a secret location where he lion tames Connor Trenier and Dominic Keating, producer of the Shuttlepod show, Mark Cartier. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, hello, Mark. Hello. Thanks for being on the show. And we couldn't have a geek panel without a guy who literally has it in his name. Our live action Mr. Clean, geeking with James Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> thank you yes yeah, good to have you brother are you guys ready tonight's special guest is one of my favorite star trek characters of all time he gave us an entirely different perspective of what the holodeck would could be after six decades on the stage in television and on movies this man will forever be remembered and loved for two episodes of star trek and a cantankerously witty butler on the nanny i am proud to introduce you to professor moriarty himself daniel davis hello yeah. Woo. Thank you, thank you. very happy to be with you thank you Thank you so much for coming with us today, Daniel. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we got a lot of Star Trek fans out here, and we all think you're the cat's meow. Uh, <laughs> let you. me just say first that some of your most beloved characters have rich English accents. Can I tell you how surprised I was to learn you are, in fact, not English? <laughs> you are born, bred, and raised in the great state of Arkansas. That is um, true. You know, uh, did did it sharpen? Did you learn the skill sharpened on the stage? Where did this beautiful English accent come from? Well, the truth is, I was born and raised in a little, really small town called Gurdon, Arkansas. It was the butt end of the Missouri Pacific Railroad back in the day, and uh, my mother's people were railroad people, and my father's people were grocery store people, and um, my mother. Um, sort of picked up on the fact that I uh, was not like the other kids when I was very young. And uh, so there was something called the, a traveling elocutionist. It sounds like something out of, uh, you know, <laughs> out of a novel of some kind. But there was a woman who came around and helped you with your accents. My mother did not want me to sound like I came from Arkansas. <laughs> and so at age five, she started me with this woman and she would come around about once a month. She made a circuit from Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, uh, Mississippi and Tennessee and, uh, and back again a month later. And she would give you poems to learn and memorize. Mm. And uh, and then you would memorize the poem and you'd perform it for her when she came back and she would correct her speech. So it started with me when I was very, very young. And then. My parents ran a movie theater uh, am among many jobs that they had uh, as a young couple. And my father ran the projection and my mother ran the concession stand and sold the tickets. And they had something in those days called the cry room, which was a, a room with a, a speaker and it was glassed in so that women with babies could sit and watch the movie. And if the baby cried, they wouldn't upset the audience. And they put me in a high chair and I watched movies from the time I was two until I was about five. And um, I loved all of the English movies. I loved the English comedies. I liked all that sort of high style stuff. And um, w one thing led to another and I just started sort of affecting a British accent that got me into a lot of trouble in Arkansas in junior high school and high school. Why are you talking so fancy? And um, so uh, that was how it all started. And then um, m my training was such that um, I wanted only to do classical theater. I, 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 I love the movies, but I never thought I would be in any. I didn't, it, didn't, it seemed like something way far away uh, from where I lived and the world that I was growing up in. And I had an aunt 
who introduced me to theater and took me to Little Rock, to the big city, and we saw touring productions out of New York. And I, it just became something that I wanted to do. So interesting. That's how so, I started. So Shane, you were I part have, of a. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Robert. Go ahead. I just I just wanted to point out, Mr. Davis, that there's a there's a very interesting Star Trek connection you have that isn't <laughs> Professor Moriarty. And that is you, you, sir, were Captain Charlie Davenport, <laughs> Captain of the USS Enterprise. That's so true. And you took command of the Enterprise in 1984 which means that you were in <laughs> command of the Enterprise when the crew of the USS Bounty, Captain James Kirk, Spock, mm. Scotty, went back to 1986 San Francisco, <laughs> and they were actually on the Enterprise oh, that you, your character, was in command of in the movie Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. So you could actually say, while you wow. didn't appear in Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, if you were in command of the Enterprise and you took command in 84 during the Hunt for Red October incident, you were also <laughs> captain of the Enterprise in the feature film Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. Now, that's about as geeky as I can get. That's Robert, I have, I yeah, have I like never that. put that together in my life. And <laughs> I am in your debt for the rest of time. That's I think, a lot I think of, it's a lot of dots. You should dine out on that forever because that is fantastic. I oh god, I wish I'd known that before. I could have dined out many times. That's a fantastic story. And because they're both Paramount films, <laughs> of course, it, it's canonical. It's canonical. and of course, you know, and and and, and a, a of course a a, a a ancient the the great 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 grandmother of Doctor Crusher also appears oh, in the Hunt for Red October. <laughs> wow. So You're then, amazing. You have amazed me. I'm going to rewrite my resume. <laughs> We're going to all all levels of deep on this one. I love that. That's a great theory. My my brain is blown right now. It's not a theory. It's a fact. Maybe. What are you talking about? Uh, I mean, I love it. captain of the USS Enterprise. Well, so yeah. So uh, that's funny. So Chekhov broke his, you know, got injured on the Enterprise during the the voyage home. So the the CO must have met Chekhov back in 1980. Uh, no 86. doubt. No doubt. Um, so you got your start. So interesting. So you were in uh, you were in a, a version of our gang or Little Rascals, right? When you were eleven. Well, so. yes. Um, when my father um, uh, decided that he wanted to move the family to Little Rock, I had come on come home every day from school and turned on television and uh, watched the show that was originated live in New York in Little Rock every day called Betty's Little Rascals, and it was a woman named Betty Fowler who had was an Arkansas native and she moved to New York, you know, the story, I want to go to New York and, and become a star and she didn't. And so she came back to Little Rock and became um, a local celebrity doing um, the Arkansas version of the Today Show that followed the national version of the Today Show on NBC. And then she had this kids program every afternoon at 4.30. And um, so I would leave school at three o'clock and we would go and we would rehearse for like 15 minutes and then go live on the air every day. And we showed our gang comedies, uh, Little Rascal comedies, but we also had a, um, uh, we would go out and do silent movies of our own, make them and uh, show them sometimes. And we had kids called the clubhouse members who would come to Betty's club and uh, we would serve hot dogs and, and uh, I don't know, RC or some Southern drink, Dr. Well, Pepper or something. And, uh, and uh, I wrote her a letter from Gurdon and said, my daddy is moving us to Little Rock. And when I get to Little Rock, I want to be on your show. Hmm. And uh, she wrote me back and um, said, when you come to Little Rock, have your mother call this number and come in and we'll, we'll have a meeting. I was 11 years old. So I followed through and my mother took me to the studio and Betty Fowler said, what can you do? And I said, well, I can sing and I can dance and I can do impressions of movie stars. And she said, well, do something for me. And I did something for her. And she said, would you like to start tomorrow? And wow. so I started the next day and I was on that show until I was about 16. And one of the, one of the directors, uh, we had like three different directors who rotated. Um, one of them was the, community theater, Little Rock Community Theater director. And every time they needed a kid, he would uh, put me in it. So I got to play all these great, you know, like the little boy and the member of the wedding. I started, you know, working on stage 
when I was that age. And uh, yeah, that's how, that's another way it began. Wow. Yeah. So then you went from there, you ended up in an organ, right? You ended up uh, in acting academy, right? Well, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, I was in, uh, um, in Little Rock. Uh, do you all remember Winthrop Rockefeller? He was one of he was uh, one of the younger scions of the Rockefeller family, and his brothers were governors around the state. He wanted to be a governor somewhere, so he moved to Arkansas and he bought this huge farm. And his wife Jeanette was a cultural uh, member uh, a member of the high society in in New York. And she said, "There's no cultural life here," so they built a school and an arts a theater with an with a. Uh, an art department, a music department, a dance department, and a theater department. They put six million dollars of, of money from 1964. That's a lot of money in 1964. Wow. Yeah. And they built this thing. And uh, then they hired a man uh, who had recently left uh, Baylor University, Paul Baker Theater Department, a man named Dougal MacArthur as the artistic director of the theater. And they they started offering native sons and daughters free rides to come to this school mm. and uh so i was doing a play and mr macarthur came and saw me in and he's and he offered me a free free ride so i went there for four years and rockefeller was elected governor and he was governor for eight years i think and then or six but when he wanted to turn the financing over to the state the state uh, legislature said we're not interested they're a bunch of hippies and freaks and weirdos and we're not we're not going to pay for their education so uh the school died it just disappeared so i have a non-accredited degree from a non-existent college but it <laughs> never, never stopped me <laughs> that's fantastic and why would so, it mm, yeah so you went from go ahead well i was just going to say one of my teachers uh at the art center was a guy named kirk me who had been at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Mm -hmm. And when 1968 came and it was the summer of our graduation, he said, you should be at the festival and I'm gonna get you in there somehow. And he called Angus Bomer, who was still alive and ran that place. And he said, I've got this actor I think you should hire. Well, you, d you didn't get hired. You went there on your own uh, nickel and you auditioned cold and you were cast cold. So you didn't know what you were gonna do till you got there. And there were only, it wasn't an equity theater at that point, it is now, but in those days, they had five equity leads who were playing parts and directing each other in other productions. And then the rest of us filled in the blanks, a lot of young student actors. And I got fantastic casting and uh, had a great summer. So that was Oregon. That's awesome. So, so tell us how you get, and we're going to get to Professor Moriarty in a second. And everybody out there in the chat's like, we want to talk Moriarty. But I think it's important that we kind of we kind of landscape you here and give give us the roadmap. So you end up uh, eventually on a uh, on a little TV show, uh, a soap opera called Texas. Yeah. Uh, in 1980. Yeah. And uh, it was a uh, I think it was a spinoff of Another World. Right. That's right. <clears throat> so you ended up doing 181 episodes on that. So what was the transition from theater to TV? Well, you know, I had I had had a, that that didn't happen until the 80s. Um, and I had been in regional theater around America for all those in between years from 1968 to 1980. And then I left uh, ACT in San Francisco and went back to New York, which is where I had really begun my career. And the first two auditions that I had were for a Broadway play that was coming called Amadeus with Ian McKellen and um, and a soap opera called Texas, which was a spinoff of Another World. And I auditioned for them both and I got the soap and uh, I was asked uh, to understudy Ian McKellen as Salieri and Amadeus. So I was able to do both of those jobs and I took the soap opera because uh, as my agent said, what's the most money you've ever made in a week working in the theater? And I said, the most, most, most $500 a week. He said, well, they want to pay you $800 a day to start. Wow. And I said, ah, oh, I see uh, economics. I got it. So I took, <laughs> I took the uh, soap and I didn't take Amadeus because of a 
you know, having to work on Wednesdays um, on the soap opera. But they went to Washington to try the play out and they came back at Christmas and they were unhappy with the understudy that Ian had. So they came back to me and asked me if I could do it now. And my agent arranged for the soap opera to let me off on Wednesday afternoons. So I ended up standing by for uh, Ian in uh, Amadeus and went on for him several times. And then it ultimately led to me being asked to play Salieri on the national tour of Amadeus. So, but you asked me about the transition. The transition was that I was used to playing in a theater that had 1500 seats. So I learned how to project my voice and my thoughts to the back of the, you know, of the top balcony. And all you had to do to, all you had to do, it sound, I made it sound so easy. All you do is just bring it down. You're playing a camera lens box mm -hmm. and you just bring everything down as small as you can get it. And uh, it took me a while to make the adjustment, but I was fortunate to be working opposite a fantastic woman named Beverly McKenzie, who had been on Another World forever. And she became my tutor because I played opposite her on the show. And she would just, we'd do a take and she would say, just give me a little hand signal, bring it down, bring it down. And so we do it again. And finally, about a, after about five episodes, I figured out how to do it. Um, and then it stood me in good stead because the nanny ended up being a five camera show as the uh, as the soap was. So I already had a couple of years of experience with that. I'm sorry, you have to just tell me to shut up because if you ask me a question. No, I, <laughs> no I, we want to hear it all. I this is go, great. I go <laughs> until somebody holds up a, a flag. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, so, uh, so Ian McKellen, I mean, but you, yeah. you're his understudy. I mean, he ends up being, you know, one of the biggest actors in the planet. Yeah. Uh, do you have any stories for us? And was About he fooled Ian? by your accent as well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've fooled a lot of people. In fact, Christopher Nolan got really pissed off at me during the making of Prestige <laughs> when I told him that I wasn't British. And he was like... <laughs> 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 that was my face. That was my face. Can't be true. Um, yeah, I, I fooled. I, I fooled a lot of people, and I, you know, I had when I, when I wanted to train back to the Arkansas thing with the art center. We had a fantastic woman who was our speech and uh, speech and voice teacher, and she got rid of all of all of our little southern southernisms, our diphthongs, and all the things that we were. You know, I used to call him my uncle instead of my uncle, and I, things like that uh, because I, you know, I grew up talking like everybody else. And uh, every time I got on the phone with my father, I'd spend the next three days trying to lose my my Arkansas accent. Right. <laughs> hey, hey, boy, how you doing? Fine. <laughs> How are you, Dad? Oh my gosh! Fine, fine, fine. I gotta awesome. ask uh, about. I mean, Salieri is one of the great. Uh, Amadeus is one of my favorite films of all time, and I later was able to see a stage production of it. And Salieri is one of the great characters, I think, of the 20th century in terms of what was it like to play Salieri on that traveling. It was. Um, Touring with it was hard because sometimes we did split weeks. You know, we'd have Tuesday and Wednesday in one town and Thursday and Friday in another town and and getting on the bus and traveling around. It was exhausting. But the role itself uh, is just one of those um, extraordinary roles that comes along, uh, you know, not many. Peter Schaffer, who wrote the play, also wrote Equus. And right. I played Dr. Dysart in Equus at ACT. So I was very familiar with with Peter Schaffer's cadences and the fact that he's always, always about uh, worship. All of his, almost all of his plays are about finding something to worship, something greater than yourself. Uh, the doctor in Equus worships the, the, even the sickness of the boy because he has this passion. Uh, and Salieri worships Mozart because Salieri believes that he has made a pact with God and that God hasn't held up his end of the bargain. And the play right. is very different from the film, much more yep. different. But to tell you a quick story about Ian, um, he was sick uh, about a month into my being uh, cast, and I had to go on with four hours notice um, in this enormous role. But I had rehearsed with Peter Firth and with Amy Irving, who had replaced the original to uh, cast members. So they were used to me and I was used to them. And then 
some of the cast members were calling Ian and saying, you better get back because this kid is good. <laughs> That's awesome. And so when Ian came back to work, he sent me a note one night and said, let's have dinner after the show uh, tomorrow night. And I, I wrote back and said, I would be happy to do it. So we went to this place and he asked the question that no actor should ever ask another actor. He should have known better, but he did. He said, so what do you do that's different from what I do? <laughs> and I, thought, I, 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 I I've modeled my performance after you, Ian, so that I'm not throwing, you know, the other cast members off. I mean, I, I try to give them as much as they're used to. And he said, no, no, there's something else. There's something else that you're doing that I don't do. What is it? And I said, uh, this is this is really kind of embarrassing in a way. I said, well, do you believe in God? And he said, no, of course. <laughs> and I said, well, I do. And that's why my performance is different from yours, because I actually believe in a God that Salieri could make a bargain with and mm -hmm. feel that God had betrayed him. And then he's oh, going to... He's going, to get his, he's going to get his vengeance on God. And that's, you know, that's what the play is, is that he destroys Mozart uh, in the play. Uh, and so, so that was the difference. And then to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think Ian ever spoke to me again after that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sir Ian, it's about believability. That's what we're doing differently here. <laughs> I oh, that's a great story. mean it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a really great did, story. Uh, <laughs> did I have to ask, did Christopher, you know, it's funny because I think that filmmakers, like if you if you are, this is just a theory, I can't prove it, but if certain yeah. actors are in things that you're a fan of, whether mm -hmm. it's Star Trek or Hunt for Red October, mm -hmm. as a filmmaker, when you see, because I I went through this myself when I made a film, there was people that I wanted to get that were in other movies, mm -hmm. and not necessarily anything to do with the movie that we were making, but I just love them as actors. Yeah. And I'm curious, did Christopher Nolan, had he seen you in something and already loved you and just wanted to have you in the movie? Not at all. No, he, he didn't. He didn't know me or anything about me. I went in, the casting director called me in. Um, and I think, um, and I auditioned for Christopher Nolan for one part, and then he gave me another part. Um, okay. But I, I, he did not know me. The, the interesting thing is, is that one of the reasons that I ultimately left uh, living in Los Angeles was I couldn't get out from under people thinking that I was a British, British comedian. Mm. Because I had done so many, uh, you know, I'd done 145 episodes of The Nanny. And when it was over, I was getting calls from my agent. Listen, they've got a butler voice in a cartoon they want you to do. And it's like, no, I've had one butler in me and that's it. I'm not doing any more. And uh, I don't want to be typed as a butler. I'm not British. And he said, well, everybody in the industry thinks you are. And I said, well, it's your job to tell them that I'm not and to convince them that I'm not. Uh, I can't do it if I keep getting British parts. So, um, you know, so I left LA and went back to New York where I knew it wouldn't be uh, as much of a problem. I mean, you don't get typed in New York the way you do in LA. But you have yeah. to be the one actor in American history who suffered from that problem because I feel like so many actors, or American actors at least, when you hear them attempting an English oh. or an Irish or a Scottish or a Welsh accent, it's so just like a train wreck in slow motion. Yeah. <laughs> what is kind of like, I guess, the, uh, the, the secret sauce in terms of technique in order to try to like hone or perfect an accent that sounds regional, that sounds authentic? Because it sounds like you've almost done your job too well that you're, you're trapped <laughs> in this artificial creation of yours. That's it. You've solved the problem. I do my job too well. <laughs> um, I'm too good. Uh, I think that um, it's, uh, first of all, in school, we had a course that was called ear training. And ear training was somebody who is proficient mm -hmm. in accents, who, sit, who sits in on rehearsal and gives you notes and then you know you go and have private sessions with them and you train your ear to hear accents from not just england but from all over the world i mean you know i've i i've played french i've played german i've played russian i've played all kinds of different accents over the years but british seems to be the one where the best literature is that i'm interested in doing you know this the best some of the best plays and then 
and her name was Edith Skinner, and she literally wrote the book on it was called Speak with Distinction, and she she is the basis for all the teaching that's done these days in movies. I mean, uh, Tim Monick and Jessica Drake and all these people who are still giving vocal lessons to actors who have to do accents. Um, so. Um, so uh, it's a, just a, it's a matter of training your ear. And then if like uh, the last play I was in in New York was um, a, a thing called The Low Road and I had to play um, a Scot, a Scotchman. And, I, and uh, the Scottish accent is so difficult because as my teacher uh, co coach at the moment of doing that said, people who live across the street from each other in Scotland don't understand each other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a very tough accent. So we picked out one that we thought was sounded Scotch, but it was also theatrical enough that the audience wouldn't keep going, what the hell did he say? So um, yeah, it's just a question of training more than anything else. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank I you have so a much. funny story about accents if you'd like to hear it. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. tell us. Okay, this is about Robert Redford. Oh. So I'm making a movie with Robert Redford called Havana, and Sidney Pollack is the director. And we're, yeah. in the, we're in the Dominican Republic, and um, Bob was sitting around on the set one day and started talking about, we were talking about the subject of accents, and he said, so my experience with accents is that I hired Tim Monick to teach me a British accent to play Robert Finch Hatton in Out of Africa. And, um, and and so I worked very hard on it. And on the first day of shooting, um, I was doing a scene with Meryl Streep, who was doing, you know, the, the Danish accent, playing her character. And he said, I opened my mouth to speak, and Sidney Pollack said, cut, 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 what the hell are you doing? And he said, I'm doing my British accent. He said, not in my movie. And he, he said, well, Meryl is doing an accent. He said, Meryl is an actress. You're a movie star. Oh. <laughs> wow. And that was, I mean, you had an incredible cast in that movie. You had Raul oh, yeah. Julia, who went unbilled. You had Lena Olin. Yeah. Richard Farnsworth was in that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam Ar Alan Arkin. A Alan Arkin. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, Sidney, Sidney Pollack directing. Yeah. Um, what a it was cool. Extraordinary. Tony yeah. Plano was my scene partner in a lot of scenes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's. That, I, I, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Sidney Pollack's work, and that's. Um, what a what a great film to be in! Did you yeah. did you shoot? I mean, obviously you probably couldn't have shot it on location at the time. So you're we in the shot Dominican it in Republic. the Dominican Republic in Santo Domingo because um, it was George Bush the first was the president at that time, and he said, "I don't want any American money being spent in Cuba." Right. So uh, so we went to the Dominican Republic, and there was a an, an abandoned airfield outside of Santo Domingo, and the set designers reconstructed downtown Havana in, on the eve of the revolution. The entire wow. town. Uh, if you see that movie, there's about 15,000 extras running up and down the streets of, of that town that looks exactly like Havana and reconstructed the bar. Uh, uh, my, my brain's gone where Hemingway invented the mojita. Uh, and oh. Tony Plana and I had a scene in that bar. It was fantastic. Was, uh, was Lena Olin nice? Oh, wonderful. Yes, she okay. was wonderful. Yeah, that's good to hear because you know I've had a ever since some bearable lightness of being, you, I've had a crush on. I don't know any man that doesn't have a crush on Lena. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she actually she played um, one of the great. She did one of the great villain turns in any movie in a movie called um, Romeo's Bleeding. Uh, Romeo's Bleeding, mm. and uh, she was incredible. I mean, she was in that movie with Gary Oldman and Roy Scheider, and oh, yeah. it's such a great film. She's marvelous. She was, she was in uh, the Dominican Republic with her mother and her little, her little son. He was only about four, I think, at the time. Lovely people. Wow. Yeah, that's good. Enough. Awesome. All right, Brian, you have, we have some fan questions, right? We want to ask real yeah, quick. Yeah. Well, first of all, from Re Rebecca Spade. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, she says, "Oh my God, I was born in Arkansas. Best ever." <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we ever met, but <laughs> she looks very pretty. <laughs> we have a question from Michael Nemo. Nemo, mm. thank you, Michael. Hi, Mr. Davis. Any memories of working with Dana Moldar and Stephanie? I can't pronounce his oh, name. Yeah, Beecham. Diana Moldor, Diana Moldor, and and Stephanie Beecham. Um, I was 
fortunate to get to work with both of them on Star Trek, the first episode of Elementary Dear Data was opposite Diana Muldor. I kidnapped yeah. her, actually, brought her, uh, brought her to my hiding place and offered her tea and scones. And, uh, and Stephanie Beecham was my sweetheart, um, who they conjured up on the holodeck for me to have a companion. And uh, they are both uh, wonderful women. Uh, 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 I saw Stephanie. Stephanie came to a Star Trek convention in Las Vegas a few years ago, and we had a bit of a reunion. And I said, so if they, if they ever wanted to bring us back, because we're floating around in that little computer thing, uh, would you come back? And she said, oh, I don't think so, dear. <laughs> she said, Why not? And she said, "Well, I'm. I live in Spain now, and I'm very, very comfortable. And I don't remember being all that comfortable on Star Trek, except with you." She was lovely. So. Oh, that's that's I mean, that that episode, Elementary Dear Data, was was one of the first directed by Rob Bowman. Oh, indeed, uh, yes. young yeah. young Rob Bowman, who later went on and found success in like the X Files, and they built. There's an incredible set that they built for that episode. They weren't, oh. they didn't know, they built on, it was an amazing, you know, the streets of London, I guess. I mean, so it was nominated for an Emmy. Yes, yeah. indeed. It so was, let's, uh, it was let's send you up there. Sound, a whole soundstage with even floating water and a, and a frigate in, oh, wow. in the harbor. Oh, Sorry, I, I kept talking. Sorry. No, no, that's great. Let's set you up for that question because it is time to talk a little bit, Professor Moriarty. So all let's, right. uh, we all our fans are here. So you've played Professor Moriarty three times. Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2, Elementary Dear Data, and Season 6, Ship in a Bottle. And finally, Picard Season 3, The Bounty. Can you tell us about how you got the role originally mm -hmm. and what inspired you to play him the way you did? Well, the script inspired me because it was obviously not the Moriarty of Conan Doyle, uh, but it was Moriarty. Um, I auditioned for it uh, as one does for just about, I think if Laurence Olivier was alive now, they would bring him into auditions for something. <laughs> You, you, your, your credits, your past doesn't mean a thing. They look at your resume and go, oh, that's nice, but n nothing here but a bunch of plays. Uh, so um, I went into audition and sitting in the green room waiting to go in was Brian Bedford, who is also no longer with us, but uh, I was opposite Brian as his Rosencrantz in Hamlet at Stratford, Connecticut in 1971. And, um, and I thought, why am I here? I mean, Brian Bedford, I would give it to him hands down. I mean, he's famous, he's good, he's wonderful, and he's perfect for it. So um, it suddenly took all the pressure off of me to audition for this because I thought, I don't have a prayer getting this, so I'll just go in and do my thing and go home. And so I went in, did my thing, and went home, and the phone rang and said, you got it. So, uh, <laughs> so about... Five hours later, my phone rings and it's Brian on the phone. He said, no hard feelings, dear. No hard feelings. In fact, why don't you come to dinner tonight? So, so I, I got, got that part and, um, and it was an extraordinary experience because I was a, a fan of, of Next Gen and particularly a fan of Patrick Stewart because of, uh, you know, we have this shared theater background. And so some kind of something clicked between he and I on the very first day. And I think it was just, you know, one old theater dog recognizing another one. And, um, and so we worked together really, really well. It was a great episode. Um, trying to think if I, I remember that there was a line towards the end of the episode that had, it was talking, you know, when, when Moriarty and and Picard are sort of bargaining about what will happen to him now, now that he knows that he's a sentient or feels like he's a sentient being and wants to be human. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a bargaining that goes on between them about we're gonna find a way to bring you off the holodeck, but meanwhile, we'll store you in the computer, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But I said, there was a line where the, the, wor the word murder appeared. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick saying, I do not want to do murder. Um, about, uh, I think it was maybe six weeks after we finished shooting and they were editing it all together, my agent called and said, you got to go back. Roddenberry uh, wants to fix a line. He didn't want, uh, he didn't want uh, Captain Picard to 
ever even intimate that he would destroy another human being. So he was. He heard this word murder. How'd that get in the script? I didn't approve of that. Take that out. So we had to reshoot. We had to reconstruct that little set and oh, wow. start all over again and do that whole scene again just to get that line out. But but Gene's integrity was such that he just he wouldn't let his characters get someplace where they couldn't recover. And uh, and and he came over shook my hand, said, we're so delighted that you came and we're going to find a way of bringing you back. And I said, oh, thank you so much. I, I, I'm so touched that you would say so. And he said, no, it's, I'm not kidding. And he said, the card doesn't lie and I don't lie. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> several years later, I go back. Hard man, choking. Yeah. So what was your impression of Gene while we're there? So like, you know, it's... Well, I mean, I had all of three minutes with him yeah <laughs> but um you know he was a kind of a bear of a guy and and uh um a little a little intimidating but i'm always a little bit afraid of the bosses <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when he left the best thing that happened was patrick stewart said he never does that he never comes to the set I <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Your Patrick Stewart is so good. That was <laughs> he was very, he was very <laughs> impressed with me. That Gene Roddenberry took me aside, and uh, so anyway, um, that's 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 what I remember about that episode, at least. Yeah. So at the so you guys end up in you know you're saved in the computer's memory bank or mm -hmm. memory banks. Um, so y you got this promise to come back, but then Gene mm. passed away. Mm. Were you surprised that you know during season six they would bring you back, or how did that work itself out? Good question. Well, yeah. it was interesting because I was just about to do the pilot for the nanny. Mm. Um, it was just weeks away. And I still, I always keep my hair kind of long because I'm always getting, you know, jobs and period pieces. And it's easier to, <laughs> easier to cut hair than grow it. So I kept it long and I had it. So it still kind of looked like, you know, elementary, the episode. So um, I... I got the call and I was delighted and and I went uh, they sent me the script and I read it and I thought oh this script is amazing mm -hmm. because it really dealt with uh, just what it means to be a human being yes. and uh, and the arguments that uh, the not the arguments but the the philosophical back and forth between Picard and myself and with other characters in the show it was just so beautiful uh, beautifully written, and then bringing in Stephanie to play my the love of my life and all of that. So um, it was a surprise to be invited back, but I was glad that I was. And then I went just a few weeks later. I went to work playing, uh, you know, playing the butler. And um, I'm trying to think. There's so many, so many wonderful moments and stories about that. Um, but may I cut to Star Trek Picard because it's connected. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Star Trek Picard, the moment it was announced that it was going to happen, I started fantasizing that <laughs> I would be brought back because I remembered uh, how it ended. I remembered that we were going to put you in this computer, but we're going to bring you back somehow. We're going to make you human. We're going to get you off the thing. And I remember Roddenberry saying, I never lie and Picard never lies. So I kept my fingers crossed. I think they're gonna call me. I know they're gonna call me. And one day back in November of 2021, the phone rings, I answer, and it's my agent. He said, we've heard from Star Trek. And I said, yes. And he said, don't you wanna know what it is? I said, whatever it nope, is. Nope, I'm getting my shoes, yeah. let's go. Yeah. Whatever it is, I'm packing. <laughs> and, um, but they were so, it was interesting because they were so um, protective about the material. I don't know if you know this, but mm. they, uh, they, you know, some scripts had leaked out and they were very upset about it. Paramount and everybody at Star Trek was, was very precious. Uh, I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but they were very concerned about their writing getting out. So I never saw a script. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I wrote my own play in my head. I thought, oh, I'm going to have a scene where, um, they have figured out, oh, I have to preface this. Every time I see Bob Ricardo, he says, mm. thank you for my character, because he's yes. Yes. 
without that I'm armband, I'd question. still be on the holodeck. And I said, I know, and why can't they make an armband for me? And uh, so I thought, okay, this episode is going to be about finally getting me off the holodeck and into the real world. And Stephanie won't be there, but her program faded out many years ago or whatever, mm. making up, you know, all kinds of scenarios like for why I'm by myself. <clears throat> and then, of course, I get there and they hand me my sides. They didn't even hand me a whole script. So I went to work with only the sides and I read the sides and I thought, who the hell is this? This is mm. not Moriarty. There's even a line that Jonathan Frakes had with this is not the self-aware Moriarty we knew on the Enterprise. And and I didn't know who it was. I tried to talk to one of the producers, but I didn't get very much satisfaction from that. Um, I never met Terry Metalis. I never met Alan Kurtz. I never met anybody. Oh, and wow. so it was just flying blind. Wonderful, wonderful director named Dan Liu. Um, and I got more information from him and from the AD assistant director than I did. And so I just thought, all right, I'll just do what actors do. I'll just say what's on the page and hope that it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So then right before they were going to air it, I started getting requests from people to do interviews about the episode, knowing that it was coming. But I had signed a non-disclosure agreement, which they, you know, they make you sign. So that I said, I can't talk about it. Number one, because I have an NDA and number two, because I've never seen the episode and I didn't know what the hell I was doing in it. So, <laughs> so CBS sent me a screener and I sat down and watched it. And then, then all of a sudden the scene that follows my scene where I chase them around with the gun, I hear Jonathan Frake said, oh, he wasn't trying to harm us. He was trying to guide us. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I thought, oh, God, I wish I'd known. I mean, I wouldn't have played the scene differently yeah. at all. But it would have given me some insight into what I was doing, which was using, you know, the crow and the song and all of that stuff to help them find data. And I just thought, oh. I'm still basically a good guy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Even though I'm I using these nefarious tactics to get them where I <laughs> where data wants me to get them. Because somewhere I finally realized that somewhere in whatever function his brain had, he was conjuring me up along with all those other images to lead those people to him. So it so I'm not a bad guy. I'm just I'm just programmed that way. That's right. Yeah. Just, I'm just that's programmed. right. I Terry hope you get tells, a chance. Oh, I was I was going to say that Terry tells the story about how, you know, Paramount didn't understand why yes. he wanted to bring you back. Like uh -huh. the powers that be there. And and they weren't going to allow Terry to 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 pay for you to come back. And Terry was like, no, no, I'll pay for it my, out of my own pocket. We yeah. have to bring we have to bring Daniel Davis back. We have to have Moriarty or the, the image of Moriarty. He has to be in this episode. Yeah, when you so get a chance to actually talk to him eventually, you need to, because he did that, that, when he's asked, like, you know, why did you bring back Moriarty? He goes, because I wanted him. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's why. Yeah. yeah, and it was, it was, he wasn't going to take, they they were, were they weren't going to allow him to do it. And he was going to, if he had to, he would have paid out of his own pocket to have you. Be well, and, and he was, he was right to, to do that too, because so few uh, actors have really had an effect on star trek uh, the way you have in oh. so few episodes thank so. you that's amazing yeah. to hear thank you yeah. very much oh well i'm i'm very touched by that story because as i said i didn't get to speak to terry and i don't really know him so that that moves me thank you very much absolutely yeah brian did you have another question yeah actually we got a couple super chair um from 200 watt studio Mr. Davis, thank you for being here. Loved you in Hunt for the Red October. You did 181 episodes of Texas in Daytime. How did that serve your acting experience? Um, well, as I said earlier, it really helped me to understand uh, the, um, the modifications that an actor has to make dealing from uh, transferring from the stage to the screen. Um, you know, I mean, it's the oldest joke in the world about, you know, if you raise your eyebrow in a, on screen, it's, it goes up 25 feet. So you, you don't want to be too expressive in the face um, unless it's really, really called for. So it, it taught me uh, how to adjust my performances for the camera. And um, 
and it was the best possible uh, lesson. I, I honestly say this with, with complete sincerity. The actors who do soap opera and do it well are the hardest working people in our profession. Mm. They are extraordinary. I mean, it was a baptism of fire for me because when they introduce a new character, you are plunged into the show, into the plot, really heavily, really quick. And I was learning 45 pages a night for the first wow. two or three weeks. And I had wow. never learned words that fast and, 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 uh, and complicated scenes and emotional scenes. And Beverly McKenzie, who I, I miss to this day, um, she, would, she said, here's the secret. You get home on Friday night and all of the coming week's scripts are at your door. You take them in, you wake up Saturday morning and you learn the last episode that you're in first. Then you learn the next to the last, then you learn the next to the last, and then you learn the first one. So that you memorize the entire week and all you have to do the night before is just review, but it'll still be in your head. And she said, I've been doing that for 25 years and it works. And so that, that technique was what I started doing. I would learn the entire week and then just review the night before. And it worked. Uh, but honestly, those, I, I, my heart and my, uh, my uh, honor goes to those people who can do that well because they work so hard and they are all good at it, really good. And some of the best acting in television is on in the daytime. It's just astonishing. So, uh, Daniel, when hmm. you came back to do Picard season three, did you get a chance to meet any of the, did you get a chance to see uh, um, Patrick Stewart or Jonathan Frakes? Did, did, you, uh, did you get a chance to reconnect? Well, yes, I, um, uh, the original costume that I wore on the first two episodes was uh, was taken by Robert Blackman, the costume designer, out of uh, out of a warehouse. But when I came back, uh, they wanted to make a new costume for me because the warehouse was long gone. So they sent a they actually sent a, a tailor to my home in upstate New York to take my measurements, and then they they sent them out to L.A. and the costume people made it. So the first day I was there, I go for a fitting and I'm walking back to the car. Uh, to take me back to the hotel, and I see Jonathan standing in the parking lot, and he's talking to somebody, uh, but I couldn't see who it was until I came around the corner. And as I came around the corner, Jonathan turned to me and said, well, look who it is. And it was Patrick he was talking to in his, oh, Daniel, how wonderful to see you. Come in, <laughs> Come in and have a chat. So I went oh, into God. the trailer, and he has, like, you know, an army of trailers. But um, I went into his trailer because he was done with his work and I was done with mine. And we sat down and talked for an hour and a half mm -hmm. about, in fact, I told him the Ian McKellen story about you know, believe in God and all that. And he, he was like, oh, that sounds so much like Ian. And, and so we, we had a good, good gossip and a good chat. And then of course I was on the set. I was working with Michael, Michael Worf, and Michael Worf, with Michael Dorn and, 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 um, and, um, and Jonathan and uh, oh, Michelle. Uh, so we would sit off, you know, in our chairs between scenes and catch up on all the stuff. But I have seen them, with the exception of Patrick, I've seen them all at Star Trek conventions ever mm -hmm. since. I mean, ever since the 90s. And, um, and they have a wonderful tradition on the last night the whole cast goes out and they share the expenses of a very, very posh dinner. And they have been including me that, in that dinner for the last few years, which has made my convention uh, experience even more exciting. In fact, we are gonna be in Las Vegas um, the first, in, first weekend in August for yet another convention. So for the fans out there, come and say hello in person. We'll yes. love to see you. We'll be there as well. To yeah, see we'll you. be there. We'll we'll be good. Oh, we'll I'll get buy you a drink, Mr. Davis. Oh, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question for Mr. Davis. Uh, when I heard I was going to be on this live stream with you, I got a little overly excited and had to go back and reread the final problem. I even listened to an old uh, radio adaptation from the early 50s where uh, Orson Welles was playing your role, but just wanted mm -hmm. to know if did any of the text or descriptions or lines of dialogue by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle inform your approach to the character? Because obviously it's an incredible part and everybody's going to play it their own way. But do you have any favorite lines from Conan Doyle? And also, do you have any favorite versions of the character prior to you taking on the role 
that uh, you just really enjoyed as a young movie fan or a young radio fan or TV well, fan? Well, you know, I can't remember the name of the actor, but I, I remember uh, I remember the, um, oh, what was uh, Basil Rathbone? I don't remember who played. Was it Lionel Atwell who played Moriarty after, after him? I don't remember. I, I don't really have that strong an association with with the old films or the or the TV shows, um, and and because this Moriarty was such a departure from Conan Doyle in the sense that he started starts out as this nefarious character, but he quickly metamorphizes into something entirely Star Trek. And yes. it, it's not, it isn't uh, Conan Doyle really, it almost bears no resemblance to Conan Doyle. But so you, you do I, have that great line when about dark magic saying, oh, the best kind, I'm sure. And that yeah, really yeah. reminded me of the tone of Conan Doyle. There are probably lines that are out of uh, out of Conan Doyle that were, you know, uh, I think Renea Cavaria who wrote uh, Ship in a Bottle, probably was a little more attentive to some of the Conan Doyle stories than maybe the, the first writers were. Uh, but I can't say that for sure. I'm not really sure. Um, uh, not heavily influenced by previous incarnations because you, 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 know, you want an opportunity to make it your own, number one, and, and not be influenced and not bring somebody else's work to the performance. So he was such a departure that no, I guess the answer to your question after <laughs> long wind is no. <laughs> I, I found one line that I felt like kind of captures the, the early version of your character where uh, Holmes is describing you to Watson and he just says, he, he is the Napoleon of crime, Watson. He is the organizer of half that is evil and of nearly all that is undetected in this great city. I was like, wow, like that's all you need to know as an actor, like what a, what a, what a part. Yeah, it's true. It's true, and then you have to throw that out the moment you start speaking <laughs> and playing the character, because it's just it wasn't in, it. He wasn't very Napoleonic in Star Trek. <laughs> Brian, I think you had a question, right? <clears throat> yes, sir, I do. This is from the Shuttlepod Show. I wonder who that is. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Mark from the Shuttlepod Show. He's literally sitting right next to you, Daniel. <laughs> He's asking, I, I thought it was a very, it's a very pertinent question. It's he's very, very a super chat because he wanted to make sure he got the question out there. I see. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, when are you? Yeah. Going, you know what? I'm sorry, Mark. Why don't you just read this? Uh, Daniel, mm -hmm. uh, when are you going to appear on the Shuttlepod show? They are self-aware, hologram friendly, and run a wonderful booze as gifts program for our guests. Thank you. Uh, That's awesome. Heradura tequila, and I'm really hard to get. All you have to do is ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should you should come on to the Shuttle Pod show. The next time you're in Los Angeles, let us know. Okay, uh, I will. We'll have your tequila for you. Daniel, awesome. Daniel, Daniel their, their show is really, really, really wonderful. Well, yeah. I would love to join. You don't do it online. You do it live? They do it live. We do it live. Oh, we wow. The, we're currently shooting at the Matrix Theater. You're a big theater guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, we, uh, uh, James Darren, who played another sentient hologram on Star Trek, was our most recent guest. <laughs> Right. Uh, we just had LeVar Burton, we, and just before that was Jonathan Frakes, just before that oh, was Mike I'd Bourne. love to come, really. I mean, um, at the moment, there are, you know, there's nothing that I know of that's going to take me to L.A. anytime soon, but, you know, maybe I'll just come out and visit you and visit friends and see. There we go. Eat nice. some of my favorite sushi restaurants. That would be great. We All right, Mark, now that you've you pimped your show, do you got a question? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what's fun about your character, and we kind of touched on it a minute ago when you yeah. were, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were joking about you're not a bad, your character's not bad, he's just programmed that way. Mm -hmm. um, so Moriarty is a villain in the Holmes uh, universe, uh, but this version of the character that, that you played in Star Trek uh, uh, had a motivation that anyone, I think, could understand, it's very primal, uh, that he just wants to live. Right. Um, at the end of Ship of a Bottle, which uh, is one of the best Star Trek The Next Generation episodes, uh, Moriarty and the Countess are uh, en route to wherever they're going, and they're thinking that they've left the holodeck, but of course, um, you know, Picard has fooled them uh, into uh, to get uh, Moriarty to release the command codes so that he could get control of the ship again. Right. Uh, do you think that Moriarty uh, ever figured out that he was still in a simulation? Or do you think he was content for the rest of his life? Um, that's a very good question. Um, 
when I was fantasizing about what this episode was going to be about, um, I think that in that in that fantasy, I imagined him because of his uh, uh, keen awareness and perception of what was going, what's happening, that he he came to the conclusion that he was still floating about because where were they going to go what was going to what was the program going to allow them to do and if he decided somewhere that he wanted to land on some little island planet with a nice lagoon and couldn't do it he would yeah. have gone wait a minute i've been i've been misled to put it politely yeah. and that he would um that's what i thought star trek picard was going to be about was that he oh, had, sure. he had figured out where he was and how he was being treated and that he completely found a way to reverse the procedure and get himself but that's not what materialized but that's what my brain did um but to answer your question i think yeah i think and i think that you know i talked to one of the producers because supposedly this is patrick's you know swan song as picard but you know Never say never, dear boy. I don't know whether that's really <laughs> going to happen. And, uh, I, and so I, I don't well, know. Old. I don't know. You if can retire. Happening. You can just voice act his character. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of my closest and dearest and longest <laughs> friends of long standing is Kate Mulgrew. And Kate oh. and I have talked about maybe Moriarty can pop up on the cartoon. <laughs> mm, <laughs> she's yeah. she's oh, yeah. doing the voice of Janeway in the cartoon. And, and I said to one of the producers, you know, this character, um, he's he, he can pop up anywhere. And there are how many five incarnations of Star Trek at the moment? Come on, find something. Um, you know, get me get me going. So we'll see. I would I would love it. I'd do it in a heartbeat because I tell you, to be a part of that franchise is just the most special thing in the world really? for an actor. It's just, I mean, they. I think that they love theater actors, which is how I got the job in the first place. And I think that they love that kind of work from their casts. And so it would be like, you know, it's the closest thing to having a theatrical experience that you can have on film. Right. Put it that way. Yeah. Well, you know what, Dan? You know what's cool? Talk about that <clears throat> Moriarty is actually around. Okay, so he's <laughs> on. He's in the D's computers, the one that crashed on Viridian Three. And I know I don't know how big of a Star Trek fan you are, but let's just go. Let's just say in the in the movie generations, the D saucer section crashes on Viridian Three. Uh -huh. Now, Jordy <laughs> has lovingly during Picard uh, <clears throat> restored everything, and the D is sitting in the the fleet museum right now and guess what moriarty is in that computer so you could come back and say a star trek legacy tv show and since terry metallis loves your character i could imagine perhaps something like that happening rob what do you think a, a moriarty uh, led episode would be like in, in legacy well uh, what would be really interesting is is first of all the moriarty character would have been living his life for 30 years say it was real time yeah, yeah. so so the fact that you've aged since the end of next <laughs> generation <laughs> you could come out and play yourself like and, yeah. and what what i would find really interesting is if there was some kind of nefarious diabolical plot that they needed they they, they couldn't unravel mm -hmm. and you know maybe it was jordy who said you know there is a person i think who would be able to help us yes solve whatever this whether it's a plot with the underworld some criminal thing some who knows what it is but there's something bad that's happening and they can't put it together they've hey, tried robert, the computers can't put it together robert shane have you guys got terry metallis's phone number <laughs> yes, oh yeah we sure do yeah we sure Colin. do <laughs> Colin. yeah because we'll i mean let it would him be know. really it would be really I mean, he's gonna be on our show in a couple he's of probably years. watching right now you could write an episode on that alone. That's but with the hollow, Davis, he's with probably the hollow, watching right now. So just tell him. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> with the hollow emitters, um, you 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 could just, of course. And what would be great is, and this is what they've got to do: they bring you back. You are incredibly helpful. You you solve the problem. You help take down the bad guys. But because you have the hollow emitter, mm. you disappear. At the end of the episode, yeah. you've it's engineered a Picard, and you're yeah, you're out and you've gone out into the universe. Now you are, uh, now you're out there. You're out there somewhere in the real and world. And not only not only do you have a hollow emitter, can you freely move about the universe? 
but you can also figure out ways to hide in other people's mainframe computers. Ooh. So so oh, you could have your no. holographic energy. You know, you're like, I, I, the way I'm going to, oh, I, I just need to hook up to the computer and then suddenly you're in someone's and you could travel freely around the universe and no one could ever find you mm. unless you want to be found. Star Trek colon Moriarty. Yes. <laughs> or, or well, you know, they're making a um they're making a section thirty one movie. Ooh. So what would really be interesting is I <clears> could <throat> see them doing either a limited series or a movie that was literally all about you. Oh, God. Wouldn't a Moriarty miniseries be amazing? Oh, my God. I mean, it no, would be yes. a, a revenge. It would be the and, gift of gift to my old age. Everyone's talking about would, Khan. I want to see Moriarty. <laughs> but what would, be, what would be really interesting is, as a character, I mean, as a villain, sure. But how interesting would it be, like, in a way, go with me here. There's an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called the inner light mm. and in it picard believes he's lived a whole other lifetime yeah. right. over the course of like 53 years right mm. well you your character when you find out that you've led this 30 year life inside the simulation and you realize it wasn't real you now share this kind of you and you and picard have a bond and that you live this fantasy life but now that you've emerged now you're actually able to interact with the universe you know maybe there's something i don't know something they could tie it in like what does it mean when a man discovers his entire life that he's led is not real mm. but yet it was real it was real to you mm. and maybe during the, the 30 years you had children mm. in this simulation and you had a family and and then suddenly it was taken all away from you. Mm. So unlike, I mean, why would you, ha to be a villain, you know, you led a whole life that you thought was real, family, it changed you as a person. Mm. Or as a, and then it was all taken away in an instant when someone turned the simulation off or whatever, and there's motivation to get mm. some real revenge. When mm. Barkley, tri Barkley tripped over the cube. Yeah, I mean, whatever. And then suddenly, <laughs> what would it be like for you to find out that this life... You know, you've been tricked twice or whatever. That would that's fool me once, shame on you. Fool me two, a, two more times, shame on me. Listen, it's the best pitch I've heard all day. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and what's so great about it, the best part is the character of Patrick Stewart is now a positronic. He's a machine. Mm. So he's not flesh and blood, which means you could go and imprison his consciousness Oh, and take dang. over his body and become him. Oh, let's write and this. No wrong. one would it. know. Oh, let's write it for Terry. We'll just it's write please, it. Let's oh, so do good. This. It's all so good. You guys are wonderful. <laughs> I'm just making it up on the fly, man. <laughs> well, I hope you're not in the writer's guild. It's pencils down right now. You're <laughs> oh, yeah. up oh, oh, sorry. I'm not. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oops. Nothing, like <laughs> nothing is in stone. No, we're just we're just fantasizing. That's you know you're. That's what I did when I got the offer. So fantasies are. Uh, you know what? If the thing that is so brilliant about Star Trek and has been from day one is if you can imagine it, you can do it. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> we have a super yeah. chat from uh, Geet Sivan Nenden. Oh, nice, Brian. I said it right, right? <laughs> yeah. I said it right. I think you did it. Geet is a uh, longtime supporter. She comes back all the time to try to trick my brain into saying her name wrong. <laughs> Geet says, thank you, Geet, by the way. She she says, is Daniel Davis what's considered American posh? <laughs> LOL. <laughs> Reminds me of Kelsey Grammer's character on Frasier. Absolutely adore him and the podcast, especially Brian, because I love how he struggles with my name. <laughs> <laughs> thank well, you, Geet. You were on, you were on um, Frasier and Cheers. You were on Frasier. I was, and yeah. Cheers. I was Norm's boss on Cheers, who came to give him a raise, and they said, how did you know I would be here? And I said, because this is where we send your checks. Ah, yes. and, uh, <laughs> and then I was uh, Frazier right. uh, Niles, another Niles. I was his heart doctor when he had a heart attack on Frazier. Um, am I American posh? I, you mean, I, I hope she means in terms of my speech. Um, mm. What I have, or what I've been told I have, is something called a good American standard, which means it's American speech without regionalisms. Mm, so ah. there's no, you know, there's no uh, 
no vowel substitutions, you know, there's no, um, uh, you know, my, I think my father could make a four syllable word out of a, a four syllable word out of a four syllable word, uh, out of a four letter word, I mean. Um, and I don't, I don't have that. I, I, I hope it doesn't sound phony because it's the way I speak um, and the way I've spoken all my life, at least all of my adult life. But I've done so much uh, British theater, British plays. Uh, Ms. Skinner's rule was that if you're doing a play, uh, say you're doing Chekhov and it's translated from Russian, that you use uh, um, uh, something called mid-Atlantic speech, which is, you know, somewhere between Britain and, and American speech, you know, somewhere around New <laughs> Iceland or something. I don't know exactly what mid-Atlantic sounds like because nobody lives out there, but it's sort of a combination of good American speech and and good standard British speech. And I think that's I think that's how I sound to most people, but um, you don't know how you sound to people. I really no, don't. Mr. Davis, you sound like what my head sounds like when I read something. Ah, uh, yes? Regal? Yeah, Regal? Like, like, like everything is correct, you know? <laughs> and then I actually open my mouth and I realize, oh, damn, not that smart, damn. <laughs> no, Mr. Davis, I love the, the way you talk. It, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's like um, you take all the extra uh, stuff that we add into it in the slang and you just sort of say it properly. People say that Californians don't, their accent is the lack of an accent, but I disagree. <laughs> we don't have an, uh, an, a twinge to our accent, but no. we use so many words that other regions don't use that it's very obvious when you're from Southern California. Right, I think so. I think that's right. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, it, it, I'm so used to uh, speaking this way that, uh, that it's hard for me but it hasn't interfered with my work. Even when I'm playing American parts, I try to speak, you know, like I'm educated. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the right <laughs> word. Yeah, because when you first watch Moriarty in the in the very first episode, it's I had to go back and watch again. I'm like, is he really doing an English accent, or does he just sound extraordinarily intelligent? Thank you know, you. and it's right. almost yeah. Um, it wasn't a proper English accent. It was not something that Edith Skinner would approve of as a because. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't. Everybody thinks Conan Doyle was um, English, but he was Scotch, and we don't really know who, what Moriarty's history was. He could have been from someplace in Middle Europe. We don't, we don't really know. So I didn't use a, a real over-the-top British accent, which is, I think, what helped me get the job. Actually, speaking of uh, British accents, uh, mm. from Oliver Lavier Farage. I'm mm. As someone who is British, your accent is flawless. <laughs> Have you ever tried a Cockney accent? It's real fun to be a right geezer. <laughs> I played him. I've played the Cockney. I have. <laughs> yeah. I played do little in uh, do little in My Fair Lady, and mm. I also played Henry Higgins. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I I can do it. I guess yeah, sort of clearly. <laughs> no, that sounds great. Thanks. Well, so another question from Chappie. Daniel, oh. do you voice audiobooks? If so, what are a few titles I can listen to? Because I can listen to you read the phone book. I agree with that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've had one experience with a book on tape, and it's from Star Wars, not Star mm. Trek. Um, I did a book called Star Wars Plague Darth Plagueis. Oh. And Yes, I, and it drove me out of my mind. Um, <laughs> we want to hear it, that story. Well, it took. 15, it was wise. It did. I did fifteen fifteen-hour days mm. to record this thing. It's on fifteen discs. It was one hundred and forty-five characters, and I did not know until I had already committed to it and got there to do the work that they wanted me to sound as much like the characters from the movies, who the actors who played the characters in the movies mm. oh, wow. as I as I could approximate. Well, I, I don't watch Star Wars movies, so I I had to then go back every night and, and watch old movies where, you know, uh, Boba the Hutt or whatever was I, I, <laughs> I love it. I love it. I didn't know any That's of great. these people. I didn't know them. And and so the only person I knew from the original movie was Alec Guinness. And so mm -hmm. oh, Luke Luke, uh, Luke, he always called him Luke. Um, Luke. So um, 
I, with that liquid you, it was it was maddening. And um, um, it's on Amazon. I don't know if anybody's ever listened to it. Well, to be fair, Mr. Davis, Star no Wars. one else is watching Star Wars right now either. So I mm-hmm. said, so, to be fair, no one else is watching Star Wars right now either. So <laughs> I did uh, watch uh, The Mandalorian, actually. I liked The Mandalorian. I thought it was kind of cool. But um, no, I haven't seen those old movies. Uh, I saw the first three when they came out, and I never saw anything after that. So I don't know how successful I was at it, but they, they released it. So I guess, you know. Well, there you go, Chappie. Look it but up, I Star haven't, Wars. I haven't been asked to do another one. Um, <laughs> that sucks. Rob, it looks like you have a question. I, I just wanted to ask, what was it like acting with Fred Dalton Thompson in uh, oh. Red October? Because, I mean, yeah. here was a, a politician, you know, a lawyer, a lobbyist that also – I always loved him as an actor because he showed up in these weird things that I mm-hmm. liked. Like he was – he played a racist guy in, in an arc on the TV series Wise Guy in the late yeah. 80s, you yeah. know, Knox Pooley. And, you know, you, you, you had a great scene. It's like um, uh, when, when he asks you, because you think he's crazy and you're like certifiable. <laughs> and no matter what his credentials, I don't care for him wearing the uniform or whatever it is you yeah, uh, said. That's that was exactly what he says. That was, in a ter- that was a terrible impression of you, sir. But no, no, I no, just... Actually, I used a little bit of my Southern accent to play Davenport. Um, but... Um, Fred, he was just, he, you know, he was this, um, he was a, a politician, lawyer, all those things you described, who fell into the acting business because he was hired to play himself or a version of himself in a movie. Uh, uh, was it a John Grisham movie? Something. I don't remember what it was. But he, and then he was sort of like this, you know, perfect middle age character type. And he started working a lot. Though I have to say, though, uh, uh, he he was he just said the words. He just showed up and said the words. He didn't really <laughs> put much behind it. And uh, years later, um, right, I think not long before he passed away, he was in the Broadway play. He had never been on stage before in his life, and he was playing a, a judge in a stage version of one of those John Grisham novels. I don't remember what it was. And he literally sat at the judge's bench on stage right, facing the stage, not the audience. And you could tell, because he licked his fingers every time he turned the page of the script. He literally sat there and read the play aloud (laughs) in character eight times a week. Never learned a word of it. Wow. Uh, Well, I mean, he was, the thing is, whenever they, for the most part, whenever they would cast him, he was great. I mean, he was, yeah. he, you know, and, and he did, he did, um, cause he, he had to have been in with Paramount and <laughs> then, uh, you know, cause he was in days of thunder right after he was in hunt for October. And then, mm-hmm. and then he was in Die Hard too, you know, and, and he was always, I always loved cause he kind of brought that States person feel to it like yeah. if if he was utilized correctly and yeah. i thought in hunt for out october i love the scene with you two guys yeah yeah you know discussing jack yeah. ryan yeah and- it was fun to do they cut the scene uh where i greet uh alex character as he lands in the helicopter and because there was a whole exchange that we had about uh, him in the uniform and I didn't. I, I objected to the fact that he was in uniform, uh, because if you're not in the service, you don't wear the uniform. Right. And uh, so my character had a stick up his butt about him having that, uh, you know, uniform on, and that's why I referred to it in the scene with Fred. I think they didn't need to have both scenes, which is why that sure. first scene was cut. But Fred, you know, he always deported himself well. I mean, he, as you say, he 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 was. You know, but I don't think he was, you know, a threat to Paul Schofield. No, no. <laughs> Did you guys shoot that one on location or, you know, were you actually on, on a ship? We were on the USS Enterprise, oh, which were. was oh, steaming in a circle uh, off the coast of San Diego. We were flown out in a retrofitted cargo plane uh, mm-hmm. that had uh, seats put into it. And it was John McTiernan, the director, our cinematographer, a couple of crew people, Alec and Fred and myself. And um, as they do to civilians who get to land on a flight deck, they bounced us off of it three times. Yes. <laughs> the C2. Yes, they did. That's the way they roll. Yeah. That's funny. A lot of fun. And then they put us in quarters 
that were right under the flight deck. So every every 15 minutes, it was like having a bus drop on your head. Yes, you that's where they sleep, the officers. Never got a wink of sleep. But the, the hardest thing I had to do on that shoot was there's a scene where I'm talking to Alec and he's in a helicopter getting ready to take off and land on the, the yep. stuff that's chasing the Red October. And they had the government had loaned the studio three jets to take off in that scene behind me. So oh. We could do three takes and that was it. And it had to happen on cue and I had to give the cue. Oh. So, and I had to do it in a line. And so for the guy that waves the flag that gets the uh, mm -hmm. plane to take off, the signal he was watching, I will stand up a little bit, well, you can't see it, but my arm was down by my side, my finger was down by my side. And when I did that, the guy did the flag awesome. and the plane took off and we got it three times. We did it right three times. So we, they had three, three prints, three cuts to use. And I was the hero of the day <laughs> <laughs> because another jet would have cost them about $5 million. So uh, <laughs> didn't happen. it is expensive. <laughs> it is. I'd yeah. play I'd play that scene on a loop at my dinner parties. If I was queuing jets to take off. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Uh, amazing. We have, we have a super from Victor. Daniel, is there a difference in the way you approach playing a hologram to a human character? What makes a hologram character dramatically unique? Thank you, Victor. Thanks, Victor. Well, in this case, it's knowing that he's a hologram. It's knowing that he is not a human being, mm -hmm. but in fact, um, you know, an image that can fade. You know, Victor, there's one thing that all of these gentlemen probably know, but I didn't know until just quite recently. But remember the scene in Elementary Dear Data when I draw a picture of the Enterprise and I show it to them and I say, what is this? Mm -hmm. They left the holodeck with that picture and showed it to Picard. Oh, now, right. if that picture could leave the holodeck, why couldn't I? So um, to, to answer your question i i don't know that you play it any differently because i just played uh what was what to me was happening in the mind of the character whether he was a hologram or a human being his thoughts would have been the same um the realization that he was a hologram only colored his ambition and his drive and his energy to become human and to be able to leave the holodeck. Uh, so that was the, the, you know, the, the driving force of the character throughout the episode. So what was the Daniel, what was the, uh, what was the direction? So when we first see Moriarty, he's watching data and, uh, and Jordy mm -hmm. and they're talking, right. And then Jordy brings up the arch. The arch. Uh, so what's going through Moriarty's mind before he changes? What was the direction on that? Well, let me think back to that moment. Um, I think that he, I think at that, at that point in time, he believes that he's on a street by a harbor in London. And this mm -hmm. device shows up in front of his eyes. And, and he seems to be the only one who really sees it. I mean, the other characters in that scene uh, are almost oblivious to it. Right. And, um, but he focuses on that and wants to know, what is this? What, why is this happening? And where did those men go? Those men just disappear in yeah. front of his eyes. And so there's some sort of, uh, some sort of machination, some magic, some something that starts his mind going. And then I don't remember the sequence right after that, but at some point they follow him. Why I can't remember why they follow him, but they follow him into his um, into his little hideaway, and that's where that first scene takes place. But I, I I haven't watched the episode in a while that I can't remember. I think the doctor was kidnapped, right? Yeah, you, you kidnapped yeah. doctor. Yeah. I, I will uh, right. I, I do that right away, don't I? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I'm I'm very you see curious. The arch. Yeah. You see the arch. Right. Yeah. And then you get the black magic line. But then when the you know, arch goes away. Mm -hmm. He goes over and says arch and it reappears. Yes. So something is really happening in, in his mind, you know? 
I'm, I'm curious if they uh, if they explain to you what the the holodeck was, uh, or mm. if you just intuited it from reading the script. Well, oh, I knew what the holodeck was because I was a fan of the show and I had seen you've been it. Watching it. Yeah, I'd seen it in in use. Yeah, because so I watched right away. Yeah, yeah, I watched the whole first season and and mm -hmm. I, I don't remember what number my episode was in season two, but it was. Uh, it was uh, episode two. Oh, it's like the second episode of the yeah. second season. So I was familiar with the cast and with, you know, most of the effects and they'd used the holodeck uh, previously. So yeah, I you said you were, a... you said you were emotional. I've heard this some, somewhere else where you said you were emotional when you saw that Jordy saw data for the first time oh. on Picard season three, you became right. emotional. Are you, I mean, you sound like you're a Star Trek fan. A lot of the actors aren't really technically Star Trek fans, but you really do seem like you're one. What's well, been your experience with Star Trek? I have to tell you, uh, honestly, and I might even tear up telling you, um, the first episode of season one, when I heard da, 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 the, the theme, just the first four notes of the theme, <laughs> my eyes explode. I couldn't stop. I could not mm. control myself. Just hearing the theme. Oh, brought tears to my eyes. Doing it now, it brought tears to my eyes because I was such a fan, and those two episodes had meant so much, not to my career as much as to my life. It just changed things. It really did change things for me. And so, yeah, the final episode of season three, I was I had to be carried away in wet sheets. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh yeah, it was wasn't it great just seeing the D back and having them all back together and around that. When they all table. walked onto the flight deck of the D. Are yeah. you kidding me? I was gone, gone. And it was such a great shot too. It was on a yeah. techno crane and it's yeah. pulling back. Yeah. And they had got the lighting just right as they're fanning out across the. What a great shot! Terry directed that shot. Directed oh, that episode. Pretty. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that I, people don't know, I probably even shouldn't tell it, but. What was the gentleman's name? Okuda that that designed the Matt Okuda. Oh, Matt Okuda. He was on this show. Yeah, he put pornographic images of Mickey Mouse and Pluto all over, <laughs> all over the set, all over the the control. There are Goofy and and Minnie Mouse just doing the nasty. It is the it is hysterical. <laughs> and of course. They never come in for a close-up, so you never see any of that stuff on camera. But if you walk over there, you go, what the hell? And <laughs> We've it's, done that on commercials. <laughs> has he, he's a, a he's lot, yeah. wonderfully <laughs> naughty. I've never nice. met him, but I, I would love to shake his hand and tell him what a great sense of, of, of humor and spirit he has to have done that to the set. I think Jonathan awesome. Brakes probably did that out to me. He said, come here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Mark, you had a question? Oh, I just, you know, um, it's such a, a relevant thing right now with uh, the conversation and the proliferation of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, you know, that uh, you were able to pioneer um, what, uh, you know, that, that question of self uh, mm -hmm awareness you know in such a real hu human way and the fact that we're now actually 20 30 years later 30 years later 40 years later however <laughs> i'm getting old uh, mm. uh we're grappling with that as, as a species now and uh to have sort of to to be a touchstone do, do you mm. think about that at all that your performance was a touchstone for the conversation we're having now? I, I hadn't really thought of that until now, but I can see your point. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I'm a bit of an old, uh, of an old timer in the sense that in, there are some, some things about the internet that I think are the worst things that's happened to our culture. Mm. Uh, I really honestly, say that but i don't say it often and i certainly don't say it to anybody under 30 but <laughs> <laughs> good idea. don't say anything to anybody under 30. <laughs> not, no. as we used to say in new york i don't trust anybody below 14th street um I, uh, i'm on 11th <laughs> oh there you have it i trust you though you look suspiciously under 30. <laughs> but uh it's just a it, it this chat this chat 
bot thing or whatever they're doing where they're GPT. that you know the, the writers guild is actually worried that some of the producers are going to have these scripts that they can't write written by ai and they will you know air them produce them i don't yep. i don't believe that's going to happen i think that's a false fear but it could if they tech if the technology is as powerful as it, as they say it is but it just eliminates so much pleasure from life to think that um you know that some machine could sit down and write a novel as good as charles dickens it's just not mm. i can't wrap my brain around it and i don't want to and i will yeah. never read a, a book written by a chat bot or whatever the hell it is because the human creative process that can give us that should have better sense than to give us that yeah well i mean well, the rum diary was the first book i ever read where i put it down and thought holy shit what did uh uh well what's his face go through to write this book yeah uh, so yeah right now well, i'm really reading the, all seven volumes of of proust because they finally have been translated by wonderful writers and the penguin edition has put them out and to you know imagine a chatbot writing proust um no. i don't think so i mean i've got three volumes i've got four more to go but I would be nauseous if I thought it was written by anybody but Proust. <laughs> Just to piggyback off of Mark's question, as yeah. I was watching this episode, I was reminded of what Robert's always mentioning on his channel, but how Star Trek doesn't tell you what to think. It gives you things to think about. Yes. Because I saw them asking the computer to come up with an Arthur Conan Doyle type story yes. from scratch. Yeah. I was like, yeah. oh my God. It's like, yeah, GPT. Yeah, because I'm happened. so adamantly opposed to AI storytelling. But here I was having my own assumptions challenged by the show more than 30 years after it been yeah. written. And it just blew my mind that Star Trek could still be so topical and so relevant yeah. all these that decades later. That was exactly later. the line that LeVar Burton read into the computer. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. A character in the style of Conan Doyle that can yes. defeat Data. That's what he yeah. said. Yeah. That's, what, that's, that's literally what the prompts are being used now. Yeah. That's really yeah. funny. And, and people are saying that that AI uh, becoming self-conscious is is going full Skynet, and I think that's a bunch of shit. I think uh, AI becoming self-conscious is uh, self-aware is going full Moriarty. <laughs> <laughs> that's our overlord is Moriarty. Let's yeah. let's just hope that an AI okay Moriarty that. has better intentions than the nefarious yeah. one. Well, they're they're both yeah they're both equally evil, but at least Moriarty uh, is entertaining. Yeah, <laughs> he's not just a cold-hearted killer like Skynet. I played well, Doctor Watson in a play uh, called Crucifer of Blood, mm -hmm. with the late great Peter Donat playing uh, playing uh, Sherlock Holmes. Fox Mulder's dad. Yes. Oh really? Yeah. And the X Files. Oh well, yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm sorry, my I can't help it. All, all the, your geek connections go deep. Yeah, they Robert, really you are you're a child's garden of useless information. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and proud I'm putting of that it. on a name tag somewhere. <laughs> that's so, a t-shirt. Someone write that down when making a t-shirt for Robert. <laughs> but he was but I Peter he was I love that that as an actor as well, kind of like <laughs> when he would play statesman or or uh, he was always i loved him anytime yeah. he showed up there was just something also he had a very distinctive voice as well canadian he was canadian and he was uh, well, born in canada but he was robert donat's nephew the great robert donat from goodbye yeah. quite naturally yeah that's it i didn't really put that together i just got goodbye mr chips on uh blu-ray oh Warner well, archive just such a great out. movie that's yeah. peter Peter's uncle. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, Peter. Uh, Peter's no longer with us, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so many of the greats have left. Have left us, and I was so. I've been so fortunate in my career to have worked with some of the greats, and you know, I spent a year on the road with Catherine Hepburn in a musical yes. called Coco, and uh, I learned more from being around her than I had learned in any school or any class anywhere, uh, because. Is that just the way she conducted herself. And uh, she knew a wonderful it, story. to be number one on the call sheet, you know? Yeah. Right. You actually had a wonderful story about Katherine Hepburn and your family. She get pretty close to your family, right? Well, I, I would say that we were playing at the Dallas Music Hall, Dallas Summer Music Hall. We played there for a week. And we had been in Toronto and St. Louis, and we were on our way to Dallas. And when we were in Toronto, I went to her 
after a performance one night. I said, we're going to be in Dallas. Um, would you consider coming to uh, my home, my parents' home, for dinner after a show one night? Oh, no, I could not. I, no, no, I never do things like that. And I thought, <laughs> oh, okay, well, I asked. Um, then we were on the plane going to Dallas, and I, she was sitting in the aisle seat, and I passed, and she grabbed my hand, and she said, is that invitation to dinner still good? And I said, oh, yeah, of course. Of course. And she said, I'll be there Wednesday night after the two shows. And I said, great. And so I called my father and said, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, what does she eat? What does she eat? And I said, as far as I know, she eats almost the same thing every night. Uh, she has a filet mignon and, um, and some broccoli and some salad. And she likes butterscotch Sundays for dessert. And so my father went out and bought two tenderloins of beef about that long, and he could he grilled them uh, on his charcoal grill, being the true Texan Arkansan that he was. And she ate half of one, and uh, it was astonishing. I had three other cast members there for that night. My mother, my mother had been in. Um, uh, uh, what's the best way to put it? She. She was suffering from uh, a bipolar disorder and she was in a hospital uh, for some treatment. And she came home about two days before Miss Hepburn was coming to dinner. So uh, we had this wonderful meal and she said, where is your mother? And I said, well, I, I, you know, I told you about her. He, she said, I know, but where is she? And I said, she's in, my, in her bedroom. Where is it? Down the hall, through the door. So, she said, well, has she eaten anything? I said, I don't know if dad's given her a plate yet. Give me a plate. So she took a plate, went back to my mother's room. And this was about um, quarter of 12 at night. She did not emerge from my mother's room until quarter of three. Oh, wow. And she sat with my mother and nobody was allowed in the room. We couldn't go in, couldn't disturb her. And um, so, the next day at breakfast, my mother said I had the strangest dream last night. <laughs> I, dreamed, wow. I dreamed that Catherine Hepburn came to my bedroom and <laughs> talked to me. And I said, Mom, she did. That was, that was Kate. That was Miss Hepburn. Really? I said, yes, it wasn't a dream. And the next day, Kate sent her car and driver to our house, front seat and back seat, full of roses. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And the chauffeur brought them to the door and with a beautiful note. And the note said to, my, to Jim, thank you for the wonderful steak. You're the first real man I've met since Spencer died. Oh, wow. 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 Oh. Company. Wow. That's a compliment. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was amazing. Of course, Spencer Tracy, unbelievable. Wow. I would have given and, up. Uh, I, went to her, I went to the next night, I went to her, the dressing room and I knocked on the door. Who is it? It's, it's Daniel. Said, Go away. Go away. I know, I know, I know. Go away. Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, wow. That's very sweet. That's a great story. That was, that was her to the ground. I mean, she did so much for the company. And, you know, talk about somebody who goes onto a set and knows the name of every crew member, their wives, their children. She knows, wow. speaks them by name, sends them birthday and Christmas presents. She was a lesson of how mm. to be in this profession. Mm. Amazing. She did, we did a press conference in Los Angeles, and she invited George Rose and Gene Arnold and myself to attend, but we didn't get to talk. But some young um, up-and-coming reporter, reporter said, so Miss Hepburn, who would you say is your favorite actor? And she looked at him and said, if you have to ask that, you are dumber than you look. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You do her voice very well too. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So let's. Uh, the, you have such wonderful stories. We could just keep doing this. I. I but I want to switch gears just quickly. Um, so at the same time you were doing the second, uh, your second episode as as Moriarty, mm. you said it earlier. You were preparing for a pilot for another show, which you would become a, an, an iconic, legendary character in, in television wow. uh, with Niles uh, for The Nanny. So can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Because I love that damn character. Oh, thank you. I love that character. Thank you. Um, well, again, it was one of those situations where um, um, I tell this story all the time, and I don't know if Fran has ever heard me tell it. 
it's the absolute truth. But, um, you know, you go through a process. You go to, to the producers and the writers in Fran Drescher for your first audition. And you read the scene and you leave and that's it. And then you wait to see if they hear, if you hear back. So then you go through a process where the next time you go, you go to the studio that's going to produce it, which was TriStar. And it's a little bit of a theater, a little bit more people there. And then if you pass that, you go to the next audition. You don't see who else is auditioning until you get to the last audition, which is when you go to network, and in this case, CBS, and you go over to the CBS studios, and there's a sort of little, a little tiny theater, and you go in and you do your audition again. And on the, that day, you find out who your competition is, because the networks will never allow a casting director to bring more than three actors for every available role. So they narrow it down for two, from two or three hundred, who knows how many, start. And when I walked in, there was a gentleman there who was from Pakistan who had an impeccable British accent, like a, like a posh British accent. Mm -hmm. And there was Roddy McDowell <laughs> and there was me. Yes. Oh, and I oh. thought, okay, this is back to Brian Bedford again. Roddy McDowell has been acting in this town since he was 14 years old. He's a huge star. Mm -hmm. And why am I even here? It's just, you know, it's just so they'll have three people to bring in. And I thought, okay, I, don't worry about it. He's, it'll be Roddy. So, and I knew him slightly. I'd met him a couple of times at various functions. And we congratulated each other and wished each other well. And then I, I did my audition. I was very relaxed because I knew it was Roddy. <laughs> and then by the time I drove from CB, CBS Studios back to my apartment on Ridgely at that point, um, the phone rang and my agent said, you, you're doing it. You got it. And I said, what? Because it was my 14th pilot. Oh my gosh. And wow. none of them had been, only one other one had been picked up and I got let go from that one because they replaced me with a, uh, they needed a female actor in that role instead of a male actor because they wanted a tension between the female and the male lead. Which one was well, that one? Uh, it, it was called Hawaiian Sun, Native Sun. It was Richard wow. Chamberlain. And I think it had one season, but it shot in Hawaii, which would have been worth doing. Um, but anyway, so the phone rings, I hear that I've gotten the part and I had told my agent, if I don't get this one, I'm moving back to New York because I've had enough of this nonsense. I keep auditioning and auditioning and I always get down to the next to the last guy and I don't get it. So I'm, this is it. If I get this, I'll do it. If not, I'm done. So I got it. So. I didn't know what to make of it because I didn't expect it. About an hour later, my phone rang again. Is this Daniel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Fran Drescher. I said, yeah. And she said, I bet when you saw Roddy McDowell, you thought it was going to be him. Well, if it had been Roddy McDowell, it would be the Roddy McDowell show, and this is the Fran Drescher show. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I thought, Okay, I know what I'm going to be doing for the next <laughs> few years. I'll be over there serving tea and she'll be getting the laughs. But then somehow or other, I, I, I managed to uh, strike a chord with the audience. They tested the show. It tested higher with the test audience than anything CBS had sent out in a long time. And my mm -hmm. character was 100% positive. So CBS said, you got to start writing for that guy. And they did. Yeah. And they did. Well, let's say, let's be clear. You stole the show. I mean, we, you yeah. know, Fran's great. We love Don't Fran. Don't ever let her hear you say that. I, I know. Well, come on the show, Fran. We'll talk with, talk about <laughs> it. But, you know, your character, I mean, the writers just really just did it up. And, you know, they weren't afraid to be a little naughty. And you know, the whole relationship you have with CC, kind of going through the, the entire. So did the character start out that way? Or did you just kind of, you know, did it evolve into this more? Well, we, I know he was, we, were, we were oil and water in the pilot, Miss Babcock. Yeah, yeah because right. I knew that she was after him and I knew that uh, she was wrong for him. Um, and I had, you know, I, I, I had never had anything but rude things to say to her. And, uh, and it went on that way for, you know, five years. And then she started saying rude things back to me and it sort of turned me on. And then we ended up a couple. <laughs> Only God and the writers know how that happens. Uh, yeah, I have to true. say that I um, worked, the last project I worked on, I produced and edited a movie that Renee Taylor was one of the stars. 
and her husband Joe Bologna. Joe Bologna. Uh, yeah. She just celebrated her 90th birthday. I was there. I was oh, at the you, party. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So I didn't know that. There you were. Yeah. Um, she. Yeah. And her son directed the movie. Uh, Gabe. Gabe. Yeah. And um, she was a trip, man. I. I. At one point, we set up the edit bay in their house in Beverly Hills, <laughs> and I was editing in her crazy house that was Shirley Temple's <laughs> house, and and she was. <laughs> Working with her was a lot of fun because she would just kind of come in and offer us wise pearls and then kind of flow out. And it was hilarious. I, I love her. She's a total pro. And she's one of the great, great comic actresses around. And she, her, she's written a play. She's written two plays. But one of them, um, I had seen her for dinner uh, a, a year before this birthday party. I said, what are you working on? She said, well, I've written a play about Mae West when she was 82 and she had a 24 year old boyfriend. And I said, are you gonna play Mae West? She said, yeah, I'm gonna play it even though I'm a little old for it. She was 86 at the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> she, so, she was an Academy Award, she was nominated, her and Joe <laughs> wrote Lovers and Other Strangers. It was a right. play that they had written that was then later nominated for an Oscar for screenplay so right. she's an academy award nominee as a yeah. writer i know she's brilliant and um she's got another play that's coming about she and joe when they were a young couple and she mm. plays herself telling the story of her and and joe and and how they got together and she was so funny the night of the party she said i guess everyone is wondering why i'm not in a home at 90. But Gabe has this thing about homes. He can't stand the idea of a nursing home. So I promised never to send him to one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's like in Florida. She bought a place in Florida that he's been cleaning up now and she's yeah. gonna move down there. But that was it was really interesting uh being involved with her because you know, and her she's friends with Lainey Kazan and I was uh, who was also in the movie. And then I, I, uh, Jolie Fisher. I was uh, I met Connie Stevens, and the, it was just wow. it was a trip hanging out with them because you're meeting all this Hollywood royalty that yeah. for our generation has kind of been forgotten. No, they know, were a lot of them were at the party uh, at, at the 90th birthday. Elaine May amazing. was there, and some amazing people. I was starstruck yeah. all night long. <laughs> uh, was, yeah, she. I mean, she, they knew everybody. Yeah, truly excellent, Brian. We got a couple Speaking more questions. Of starstruck. We got a super chat from Joey. He says, thank you, Joy, by the way. He says, Mr. Davis, I mm. always flub these chat things and and say stupid things, but truly, sir, thank you. You're awesome. Oh, Joey, yeah. thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Beautiful to hear. Thank you. Yeah, there's, um, you know, it's funny. Uh, you've been doing Cameo, I think, quite a bit. I have. And so you've met a lot of fans through that service. And I understand you do something actually pretty special. So you've kind of created the Niles. You've kind of continued the Niles story or written your own stuff, I believe, yeah. to do Cameo performances, right? And how does that yeah. work? Well, you you know, you they go on the app uh, or on the Cameo.com and they request you. And they they are able to write out what they want you to do, what what they'd like for you to do, mm -hmm. and um, then Cameo sends it to you, and you 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 set your own price. And I because of the because the economy is where it is right now, I've kept my price very low, and so I've gotten I've done. Um, let's see. Last week, the week before Mother's Day, was the week I started doing them three years ago. Mm. And in three years, I've done uh, 1,800 of them. Oh, my oh, God. Wow. Oh, my yeah. goodness. You're like and, a YouTuber. Uh, <laughs> and, done, no, it, he's done more videos than we've done. Well, <laughs> it's, just, it's just been fun because the people are so nice. But I, you know, I want to give them their money's worth. So I mm. write, I base what I say off of what they, what they have requested. Mm. And like they'll say, well, say rude things to my girlfriend. So I, will, <laughs> I will respond by saying, I can't say rude things to people I don't know because mm. it would be rude. 
Mm. And so I say, but I can say rude things about Ms. Babcock, and that's what I'm going to do. And then I launch. Mm. And I have like four or five different versions of the same material that I do over and over and over again, because I have to write it myself, and I'm just not a writer. So, you know, I steal jokes, I borrow jokes, I look up jokes from, you know, George Kaufman 150 years ago. I just, <laughs> anywhere, I, any source I can use. And, um, and I, you know, and I do, I usually do on the average between six and 10 minutes. And most of the people are doing like two minutes tops. And I just mm -hmm. give them a whole little one act play. Nice. Wow. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Do you get more Moriarty or more Niles? More Niles. Yeah. More Niles. A lot of people want that uh, sarcasm. Yeah. But I do get, so I get quite a, a number of Moriarty's, but Niles far outweighs them. Um, I'm going to yeah, get a Captain Davenport from you. <laughs> That's what I want. Oh. The Enterprise. You would be the one and only one who did. <laughs> <laughs> That's our Rob. Actually, at a Star Trek convention, a, a guy and his wife, they were from Scotland. They, I actually recorded him talking so I could use his accent in that play that I was doing with a Scottish accent. But he said, you don't have any pictures of Captain Davenport. <laughs> <I thought. laughs> That's awesome. That's what great. planet are you from? Who are you? That How was actually you? Rob. In, in, in costume. Yeah, <laughs> Robin costume. <laughs> that, no, that movie's revered, man. Yon oh, I know. Bond, it is. You know, I know. And, and, and I fell asleep Tom to the hunt, of, hunt for Red October for uh, over a decade. Do you know that I have made more money off of the residuals mm. of Star Trek than I made in my original salary? Oh my god! Oh my god! Wow. I, 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 I got. I think I got nineteen thousand dollars to play Davenport in that movie, and I've had I've made at least twice that in residuals. He's played all over the world all the time. The residuals are like fifty five cents. I mean, just, they keep getting smaller, but the money just keeps coming. Oh, it's it great! Keeps coming, yeah. Can't, people can't stop watching Star Trek. No, I know, I know. It's great. But it's also will. it's interesting that you're in the hunt for Red October, and obviously so many people have called attention to the fact that Star Trek Picard season three seemed to borrow a few stylistic ingredients and a few themes, and people really love those submarine dramas. And I wish mm. Star Trek mm. would dip into those waters more frequently. But it seems like you're the the missing link between <laughs> those two worlds. I'm the I'm the connection, the transparent connection. Absolutely, Terry Mattels was thinking about you when he infused season three with those ingredients. <laughs> yeah, but I would I would go I would go one step further and say the Hunt for Red October stole from Star Trek Two. It's possible. Oh, it's possible. Totally possible. We have a nice little super chat here from Geet. Geet is back. Hi, Geet. <laughs> Geet's back. Thank you, Geet. Was torturing CC the slap slap kiss version of romance plots plots, even though Niles ganged up on her with Fran, but also pitied her unrequited love for Max? Um, you know, that's such an interesting question. There was, I think, Lauren Lane, who played Miss Babcock, and I knew each other. She trained at ACT in San Francisco in the conservatory. Uh, but it was after I had left the company, but we had a lot of mutual friends. And so when I m saw Lauren at the first audition that we did, um, I said, we know each other. And she said, yes, I'm a friend of, and she named all the people that we knew in common. And I said, wouldn't it be a hoot if we got this? And so we kept showing up at all these callbacks. It was always Lauren and me. We were never reading together. We were never paired together. We were always reading with the with the reader who was there. But um, I we when we got it, we were just ecstatic because we we were uh, we came from the same world. We spoke the same language in terms of you know the the the, the chat that actors use to you know talk about their objectives and their actions and so forth and so on which was complete greek to fran of course but we uh we we had a sort of little secret between us uh as friends and as co-stars and and i i said to her one day um very early on promise me you will never take anything i say seriously as a character and she said, "Oh, you don't even have to say it." I said, "No, I do, because they're going to—they're—they're—they're they're, they're getting nasty." <laughs> the writers. <laughs> I felt like the writers were taking a lot of their frustrations out of the writing room and giving them to me to say. And uh, <laughs> so I thought maybe you know 
things were going to get a little dark. And every once in a while they did, but they were always funny. No matter how dark they were, they were always funny. And there was always a redemptive moment when I tried to let her know that I was just sending her up, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yes, it was a romantic plot. As the series was coming to an end, it became even more romantic. And, um, and as you know, we were on our way to the altar when it came to an end. And so in my cameos, I pick up from the fact that we were on our way to the altar and as Niles, in character as Niles, and I say, and we have now been married for ever. <laughs> <laughs> we needed the spinoff. We needed the, the Niles and Cece spinoff show. Oh, uh, wouldn't that have been great? Oh, we, we got another super chat from Mark I had Rosen. A, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I pitched an idea uh, based on... Drew, I, Robert, you will remember this if no one else does. You will remember the Bickersons. Oh, of course. Yeah. Don Amici and, 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 yeah. uh, and the singer from the Glenn Miller Band, uh, Francis Langford. Yeah, yeah. Radio. They were a couple that battled each other constantly. And My was, dad was a huge fan. Oh, they were hilarious. And I pitched the idea of having a Niles and Cece spinoff like the Bickersons, but mm. I, it didn't, they, they weren't interested at the time. Mm. All right, you had, had a question, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, sir. From Mark Croson. Uh, thank you, Mark. First and foremost, thank you for your breadth of work. Bravo. <laughs> Second, have you have, have you written anything or do you have the desire to? What genre would it be in? Um, I, I have a hard time composing emails. I'm not really a writer. Um, <laughs> people have, Chat GPT. <laughs> people have asked me if I would... Uh, ever write an autobiography? And uh, and the answer is a resounding no. Um, it, it, it's not even interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> what about plays that you've yet to appear in? What, what, what plays are still out there that are calling your name? Um, I don't, I have what, what I have christened the kick the bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning things I might like to do before I die. And I can never remember when people ask me what I, if I, what I would like to do, I can never come up with anything. What I prefer is when somebody says to me, we would like for you to play, uh, as, as, as has happened, Bonnie Monty, an old friend who is just uh, leaving the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey, uh, said to me about 10 years ago, I think it's time for you to play Lear. And I thought, well, if I'm gonna play it, I should probably play it while I can still pick up Cordelia at the end. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um, what it did to me was it made me think I can't do that. I, I don't think I can do that. I don't well, think I think for Godot, I saw McKellen and uh, Stewart do that together here in New York about nine years ago. Yeah, I saw and that. And they too. just yeah, they, they crushed it, but I feel like that one's always a strong contender. Yeah, it's an impossible play, but they did it somehow. But I when I am challenged in that way and my response is I don't think I can do that, that is usually when I will say, but I'm gonna try. Uh, so mm -hmm. I like yeah. Be presented a challenge. I don't want to do anything that I can do in my sleep, uh, falling off a log. <laughs> but thank you, Mark, for the the comment about the breadth of my work. I think that I may be the only actor alive who can claim to having played Hamlet and been in a fist fight with Mr. T. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> I think I that is amazing. <laughs> I love that you're in the A team. I was oh on the A team. Oh my God, was I ever directed by David Hemmings? Oh my wow. God, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, amazing. All the From way Michael back to Nemo. Antonioni's uh, blow up. Blow up, exactly. Mm. Um, Michael Nemo asks, "How much money would it take if they asked you to ADR all of Moriarty's dialogue into an Ar Arkansas accent?" <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, Michael, there isn't enough money in the world. <laughs> no one Thanks, wants Michael. to see that. No one. <laughs> no, why would I do that? No. And then one more from Joey. I got to know. Did you get to walk the bridge of the Enterprise D in costume? Yeah, there's a scene where I come out of the elevator onto the uh, flight deck. Mm. Yeah. Oh, wow. That was pretty exciting. In fact, I was I walked out. Patrick was standing by my side uh, when we walked yeah. onto, onto the set. Yeah, 
I think right before we right before they called action, I said, how do you stay in such good shape on this schedule? And, oh, my God. This is all padding. <laughs> 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 oh, you could do, we could do a whole thing with just you doing Patrick's voice. That's so great. And Ian McKellen. I don't know yeah. how I don't know how good Patrick would think my imitation of him is. He might take offense. So I hope he's not watching this or won't be watching it. <laughs> do, do you do you do you do a lot of imitations just off the cuff? No, I don't really do a lot. I mean, I I um I used to do more uh when I was younger, you know, to sort of entertain at parties, but that was when my references were common to everybody in the room. Mm, mm. You know, what happens is you get to a place where I am now and you try to date somebody that you have to explain who Cary Grant is and you think this is not <laughs> going to work. <laughs> this right. isn't going to work out. <laughs> well, you're with the right group. You yeah. Know, this is an older audience. So my references in the yeah. old days were, were more relevant than they are now. Can you do a scene between Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn? Because for me, movies like Holiday and Bringing Up Baby and The Philadelphia Story are just sublime. And the fact that we no longer get to have more movies of the two of them interacting is just, uh, yeah, wounds me. Um, I'll, I'll take Katherine Hepburn out of a scene from My Favorite Wife or The Awful Truth and replace Katherine Hepburn with Irene Dunn. Um, no, I can't think, I can't remember the words. Can't remember. I, I don't know. That's okay. There's yeah, a I, scene, love, I love the awful truth as well. There's a scene where, where uh, Irene Dan tells him that she's moving to, to Oklahoma City with Ralph Bellamy. Oklahoma City. Well, if things get dull, <laughs> you can always go to Tulsa. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, well, you've been amazing. Does anybody else have any questions left before we go? <laughs> I'll take that. No, nope. James, we're good. Uh, no, it, was a, it was an honor and a privilege getting to uh, to meet you and to speak with you. And thank you so much for your time. It's been my total pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. You're all wonderful, and I I really appreciate that you brought me on. And if yes, you ever down so to 14th Street, look me up. We're, we're not all <laughs> criminals down here. <laughs> uh, the last thing is, do you have anything else in the works before we go? Anything you got uh, coming up? No, I, I I don't. I'm um. I, you know, it, it's 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 impossible to ever for an actor to ever say that they are retired, because mm -hmm. what the hell are we retired from? Um, <laughs> so um, it's just a question of nowadays. Um, there is this youth implosion on television. There is a diversity implosion. All of it is welcome, and I, I celebrate it all. But some of us older guys are just sort of like. If it's not, if there's an older guy part, it's Brian Cox or Donald Sutherland, both of whom I love, but get out of the way and let somebody else with gray hair. <laughs> so there's a Hunger Games movie for you. Yeah, exactly. So mm. I, don't get, I don't get many opportunities anymore. But you know what? I left New York. Uh, I left LA because I couldn't get out from under the butler. I left New York because the, the Broadway theater had become something that I was not really interested in being a part of. It's mm -hmm. Disney-fied, it's, you know, musical, 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 musical. I hate musicals. Uh, I was in one a few years ago and thought, I will never do this again. And um, so I don't get the calls and it's okay. I, I don't think I could do eight shows a week on Broadway or anywhere else for that matter at this point. I don't let my agent hear me say that, but I really- <laughs> uh, They're not I'm, watching, it's okay. I'm done. And, and film and television, I would do a series in a heartbeat because it's just the it's the best place in the world to work for me. I love being on, I love being on a set. I love being on a set, and I love what goes on. I did an episode last year of uh, that new Amsterdam show. I had a lady director, and there are not many lady directors, female directors in television, and she was one of the best directors I've ever worked with in my life, and she would she'd give me very useful notes and we should say that's great i can use that but try it this way and i thought really because i'm one take tommy we, uh, you know do it once and move on and she said no no i want to keep playing with this and we would do five takes and then i wouldn't know which one she was going to use till we till i saw it on television so i don't get those calls that's the short answer that i should have said in the first place 
Well, let's hope that we get a Star Trek legacy show that takes ah. place in our current storyline and we go. get a full, at least Moriarty episode. If not, go all in and let's have a Moriarty series. Come oh, on. We, we, we have a Moriarty yeah. miniseries. Yeah. I'm divine on a set. Everyone will adore me. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Listen, well, uh, thank you. Thank you. So Daniel. Much. Yeah. And Daniel, we can't wait to get you on the shuttle pod show. Thank uh, you. Look forward. In Vegas, what a wonderful conversation. Please, uh, please uh, allow me to get you a drink at the convention. Are you going to, you're going to be there. Yes, sir. We'll oh yeah, be. we'll be there. You're all going to Do you remember well, what you're be. buying him? I, I, I have it tequila. recorded on the stream. I'm going to go back and I'm going to write it's tequila, that tequila, baby. Yeah, Something come on. Well, yeah, a, a good margarita. You can't go wrong. Um, you can't go wrong. I will. Uh, I will hope that we can all like have a meal or something. Just sit down and be great. Choose Absolutely. A all well, right. At least three of us, four of us, will be there. So I look forward to it. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so fun. much. Thank you. Also, guys, don't forget we'll be back on Thursday at twelve thirty for the Unleashed show, and we have a special um, premiere happening this Saturday at noon mm. Pacific Standard Time. We are going to be pre premiering our Galaxy Quest documentary. The Making of the Impossible Movie, Galaxy Quest, premiering on our main channel. The link will eventually be in the description below. Till Thursday. And let, and also, let's... <laughs> thank you. And also, make sure you guys go visit the Burnett work and Robert, Robert Meyer Burnett. What do you have coming up, Rob? Also, happy birthday to Robert as well. Oh, yes. thank you. Oh, happy birthday. Actually, right. this is my birthday today. Uh, yeah. uh, just more shows covering I, I am i am i'll tell you what i've got coming up that's really I, i'm really excited about david goodman who's the president of the writers guild of america mm. is going to be coming on my show excellent maybe he, he stole wednesday. my idea <laughs> uh, well he, he's going to be coming on when i think wednesday night we said and he's been on my show before though and of course david uh he started out his writing career in television writing for the golden girls oh wow and and he uh has written he was a, a producer on star trek enterprise he was an executive producer on the orville and he's written hundreds of of episodes of television and just a terrific guy but he's the president of the wj leading the fight and i wanted to have him come on and um have him break down what exactly the strike is all about and 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 what why it's important that these issues are addressed. It is Excellent. very important, and I support our I support our writers in everything they're going for, completely. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. literally just had this conversation with Connor and Dominic about oh wow two two hours ago. Yeah, well, but while you're here, Mark, what do you guys got coming up? Well, now we're, we got to come up with something else. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ooh, you uh, nice work, out Rob. Here. Nice work. We have uh, we have Lavar Burton on uh, this Excellent. weekend, probably. Um, uh, we've got uh, some secret big big announcements coming up. So I guess just Ooh. keep coming back on Sundays, the Shuttle Pod Show on every Sunday on YouTube. It's a great show. Give Zavara my regards. Uh, he came to work the day after I left, so I didn't get to spend mm. any time with him on the set. So oh, give no. him my regards. What a shame. Yeah. Uh, James, what do you got coming up? <clears throat> oh, Wrong Reel. Always have uh, our weekly episodes about film history. Just posted one about uh, The Gunfighter starring Gregory Peck. Mm. Got one about uh, Outlaw Josie Wales coming up in the near future that I'm excited about. And on my YouTube nice. channel, a lot of succession commentary as well as uh, whatever big new releases are coming out as well. So, yeah, if you're a fan of HBO, succession, or whatever, hunt down Geeking with James Hancock. But thanks Excellent. again for inviting me on the show. Um, had a blast. I'm also yes, hoping so to bad. rope James into coming on our show on Thursday, but I haven't told him anything yet, so oh, I'm surprising well, him right now publicly. All also, next Monday, uh, guys, come back. We got Tom Constantino, the producer of the Orville, uh, to talk about some stuff. We might have some new news for you guys on that. So don't forget, next Monday at 2 o'clock. Thank you again, Daniel. You are uh, just a breath of fresh air. I have not been a great start to the week, guys. He's just, you're just you. wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. We'll catch much. you next time. And thank you guys all for watching. We appreciate you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all.